I'm Dr. Dilip Dhanpal, Senior Urologist and Transplant Surgeon at the Sagar Hospitals. Today, I would like to have a short dialogue with my esteemed friend, Dr. Sanjeev Hirimath, Senior Nephrologist at the Sagar Hospitals. Sagar Hospitals, as you know, has been doing transplants in the last two decades. We were the first to have started transplants in Bangalore South. And to date, we have done excellent number of cases with a success rate of 99%. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev, can I ask you a few questions regarding what are the various causes of kidney failure resulting in patient requiring renal replacement therapy? Uh, sir, it's the, thank you for introducing me to the audience. And uh, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Sanjeev Hiramat, uh, trans, a transplant physician and a uh, nephrologist in Sagar Hospital. So the common cause for chronic kidney disease all over the world in India is diabetic nephropathy. You go to any center for dial, uh, of dialysis, you find almost 50 to 60 percent of them who have chronic kidney disease which is related to diabetes. So diabetes is one of the killers for the kidney disease. So one of them and then you have high blood pressures, you have chronic kidney diseases which are related to glomerulonephritis. Many of the diseases which are there for chronic kidney disease are because of idiopathic medication taking like you know you take a lot of painkillers which can cause you kidney disease and cause you renal failures. There are some familial diseases which can cause kidney failures uh, because of gene which causes all these problems like you know you have adult polycystic kidney disease which is very common in our uh, uh, part of the country where it causes uh, swellings on the kidney and cause kidney failure. So these are common causes but if you take the cause is diabetic nephropathy. So anyone who has diabetic nephropathy or diabetes be cautious control your diabetes as best as possible and if you have a blood pressure try to control it as best as possible as normal as possible. These two if disease if you control maybe most of the kidney diseases will come down sir. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. Well elaborated. I started as a pioneer transplant surgeon, I started doing transplants in 1984. And I still remember the first cause of kidney failures was glomerular nephritis. And today now, because of the rampant presence of diabetes, diabetes in those days was fourth or the fifth on the line. Correct. Whereas now it is turned to first. Yeah. So it's just a matter of two decades. There's been a virtual change as far as the incidence of the various diseases is concerned. Yeah, maybe the lifestyle has changed and the what we look at the kidney disease, detection of kidney disease has become much more better. If you see previously not much of kidney detection was happening. Now we are able to detect it very early. So we know when it is started and when it is going to end into a dialysis stage. So previously we have Glomerular nephritis is a common cause. When I was studying, that was the common cause. But as I finished my studying and came into practice, I saw that there is phenomenal change from that to having diabetes as the common cause. The lifestyle changes are one thing which are mainly related to all these things. As a combined experience, I am proud to say the Sagar Hospitals has a dedicated team of nephrologists and transplant surgeon, the combined experience of transplants, of course, not necessarily only in Sagar, but it is almost more than 6,000 transplants. So, we are well, quite adept at doing adult transplant, but as I can ask you, I can tell you that at present we are doing live related transplants, we are doing uh, cadaveric transplants, we are doing patients <coughs> where the blood group does not match also. A pers a person with A positive can give to B positive and vice versa called as ABO incompatible transplant essentially due to newer techniques, newer molecules that have come up. We also consider doing kidney swapping. The, it is essentially unrelated but if this has been allowed by the government, you can yeah. elaborate on that. Sir, uh, these are the transplant which we are trying to do in Sagar and we have done many of them and our success rate is phenomenally very good. 98% so is really good sir. When you talk about that, do you have any backup for uh, ethical committee? Do you have any ethical committee which has to clear all those things for transplants? Yeah, most of uh, all the transplants are subjected to ethics committee. We have a battery of people from different walks of life. We have a senior retired 
high court judge who as acts as the chairman we have a police officer retired police officer who is also there then we have a pharmacist pharmacist uh, you have any psychologist there psychologist there? pharmacist and other specialties also <laughs> not related to nephrology urology because nephrology urology we become a interested party but we want disinterested you have unbiased any doc- party any doctors in that committee yes yes we have a doc- we have a number of doctors in that including the medical director who not only goad us into doing transplant but put also the brakes don't do the transplant <laughs> so you you have actually a very good ethics committee which will screen everything Each and, and every then every patient is screened and then you have a uh, thing is this documented everything each and every patient is screened not only from kidney disease point of view from investigation point of view but also from how well motivated they are so they have to go through a battery of various specialists including a psychiatrist and a psychologist who determines whether the patient is also not only physically but mentally fit to give the kidney and the recipient also is he mentally fit to accept the kidney it is also very important to realize that the financial aspects of the transplant which in the ethics committee is very very clear that to do the transplant is easy but whether the patient can sustain because the, it is a costly affair it's not everybody's cup of tea okay. second it's not a disease you do this surgery and be done with it the patient has to follow up regularly take his medication so the ethics committee goes into extensive depth of the patient's financial status to determine whether he can financially accept a certain expense per month that is required for the trans uh, suppose i'll give an example to you sir suppose a patient comes to you within how many days you can finish up a transplant how fast you can do it from surgical point of view medical point of view we can do it very quickly no, no, from legal point everything our difficulties come up because we have to get a lot of uh, in the ethics committee we have to get a lot of papers to be fixed up the patient has to undergo a notification with the government and all this we have to inform the government that we are going to go ahead so that takes a little while so From roughly you can roughly you could say can, within a matter of two weeks we two can weekend. patient that's really good which which is uh, which i think is very fast one or two weeks is very fast you can do a transplant where you are doing the ethical clearance government clearance and all Le- the things are video legal, recorded legal, legal clearance, clearance and all the things are police clear police verification, verification. that is also <laughs> so you are getting everything done within yes. two weeks that's really fast for a hospital to do it so you have done transplants for uh, so many of them what are the common complications you enquire during during the surgical time not post operative from a transplant point of view if a patient is well matched there is immunologically well matched usually we don't face any problems surgical problems could be bleeding problems could be infection problems could be wound problems but in today's era with the immunosuppression that is provided by the nephrologist friend like you with excellent immunosuppression proper antibiotics proper aseptic precautions preoperatively and in the operation theater we take extraordinary measures for getting the operation theater sterilized we double fumigate the ots so no other case is taken up the instruments are doubly so your autoclave. case is the first transplant goes first into the ot first suppose you have yeah, a yeah. transplant it you is, have a first no other transplant. case is taken the previous night so the whole ot is blocked for transplant oh yes that's the beauty yeah. of the hospital yeah. because and if the hospital is so cooperative you have a ot which is free for only transplant that's a good thing so <laughs> we ensure that on those days only the these two cases will be taken up so no other cases not even an emergency they shifted to some other ot oh that's good um uh, what i can tell you is uh, after the surgery is done the patient comes into a separate uh, nephro icu which is uh, managed by a, a team of uh, nursing staffs who are well versed in handling transplant patients and uh, we have a doctor to look after that all the things what are necessary to be done are done in a separate icu so you you face some complications in the ot which is the commonest complication you find you, thankfully you find? Uh, we have not had any major complications on the operation table uh, 
there could be sometimes we we join the artery of the recipient and the donor there could be a slight delay in the kidney recovery so, so it starting of uh, kidney yeah, yeah. there is a little hesitation from the kidney side also to start pouring out urine during that time the nephrologist and the urologist will be fretting and fuming <laughs> to get the urine coming once the urine patient starts pouring out the sudden anti climax we are all of us relieved in the ot that the urine starts coming and we are very happy this Uh, i just wanted to add intense monitoring that you carry out in the post op you have a nephro icu wherein you have one sister dedicated only for the recipient one for the donor no, no, correct I, i would like to specially mention pediatric transplants that is one of the most difficult post op managing now there you can't have one nursing staff you have to have two nursing two staff two nurses and two doctors own. and yeah. one nephrologist for the first few hours because correct. the patients the adult kid uh, now unfortunately we can only think of adult being donated to the child unless it's a rare instance where a child cadaveric child is kidneys put to a uh, to a recipient child but in general it is a adult kidney being put into the pediatric Parents child and that adult kidney, kidney is a very hyper functioning unit as far as the child is concerned so it is acts very fast and they just pour out urine and it's a herculean effort from the uh, nurses point of view from the doctors point of view to keep up pace with the urine output we have to take intake output chart every 10 minutes okay. every 15 nice. minutes and okay. for the first few hours it is uh, you have to just see the post of what it's madness ha, six ha, seven ha. people hovering around a small child how much time you take to finish up a transplant is it 2 uh, 3 hours 5 hours 6 hours usually what we do is we tend to start the donor first because yeah. donor takes time we do both open surgery as well as laparoscopic surgery open surgery is done for complicated cases when there are multiple vessels whereas a standard single artery single vein donor can be done laparoscopically after a staggering of 15 20 minutes the recipient side is started okay and usually it is run so synchronously because we need a twin ot complex so that constant messages are passed from this side to that side okay. i am at this That's stage fine. you are at that stage accordingly once the uh, donor artery and the vein and ureter is prepared then we check with the recipient side the bed is prepared properly and then when we remove the kidney we also have intermediate wherein we have to perfuse the kidney okay so that we have to evacuate all the blood the so blood doesn't a, clot you use a special perfusion, a special perfusion fluid, fluid so to use that and yeah. then and done. also we have to cool the kidney Correct. because we have to bring down the metabolism of the kidney so that in case there are delays normally within a half an hour we can finish it off but we would like to delay in case there are complications so we would like to decrease the metabolism of the kidney so that we can stretch the period over a longer period of time so we cool the kidney we not only dip the kidney in ice slush special solutions and also mm. special cold fluids which are act as good preservatives so with this we are able to delay the metabolism of the kidney and it is excellent we can easily do this over half an hour we usually finish artery and the vein and once the patient's kidney starts pouring out urine then we are fit to join the ureter to the bladder so usually on an, on within 2 and a half to 3 hours the transplant is done so, so two, uh, maybe 2 uh, 3 hours or 4 hours is max you can okay. take and uh, you are out of the ot so uh, how do you approach a patient once the patient your surgery is done what message you give to the relatives who are standing because they are very anxious to hear what's happening so are you going to tell uh, how is it functioning Im- immediately or how are you going to approach them what's your message when you come out of the ot most of the times when i come out of the ot first and foremost i tell the patient because there is a donor involved and there is a recipient involved the first thing i tell the family is the donor is excellent completely recovered extubated and conscious that's more because important for us because donor because is donor very important for us we are subjecting a donor to a major surgery donor is a normal person if you were to talk in pure ethics it is wrong to do subject the donor to so much of major surgery but it is acceptable by the government because donor is willingly coming to give the kidney then we make sure that the donor is absolutely fine then we come and tell that the patient's kidney is doing very well patient is pouring out urine and but we also tell them there are chances dangers of not only uh, rejection which can happen in early stage which nowadays are rare because we have excellent methods of determining Uh, various uh, 
cross matches and HLA match that we do, that acute rejections used to take place in the past are almost unheard of, but you can still get rejection. So, I always tell the relatives to keep their fingers crossed. As of now, patient is doing very well pouring out urine. We also monitor not only from the clinical point of view, that is pulse, BP, intake, output, everything, but we also biochemistry, we keep on repeating tests of the patient, how well the kidney is functioning at every 6 hourly intervals and then later on 12 hourly intervals, but we also monitor them radiologically. We call the radiologist sometimes on table, sometimes post-op and sometimes immediately one day later to know how well the kidney is functioning because we have various parameters we can determine radiologically how well the kidney is surviving. So, basically you are trying to see if the blood supply to the kidney is good and you are trying to see how the kidney is functioning. Yes. So, these are the two criteria which you follow and do it very well. So, uh, on an average, uh, we keep the patient for uh, 7 days in the, uh, the post-operative stage and discharge on 7th day. From a donor point of view, we keep them 3 to 4 days. Once the patient is on oral full diet, we can easily send them home on so the 4th or 5th day. day. you are going to donor send them. Donor goes home. So, uh, Most of goes our home. patient goes home, go home, donors go home on the 4th day or the 5th day. The recipient normally has to be off all the tubes, that is the catheter, drain and so many things. Once that is removed, patient is fit to go home, usually 7th day, latest 8th day. Eight day. So, on an average, the concept of transplant is only for 8 to 10 days. That is the concept of transplant. So, when your patient comes in into the hospital, worked up within 1 or 2 weeks and within 1 week, his transplant is done. That is really good for anyone and uh, Sagar Hospital is equipped with all these things and we do it very fast. And we have a competent team in, in uh, place competent uh, backup nephrologists are there, you have competent nursing staff who are and there too and you have… Intraoperative, we have a very good anesthesia, anesthesia team. also, so that is a major we issue. We need a very good anesthesia team at the head of the patient so that they carry out whatever uh, that is necessary to put the patient to sleep and also on table whatever requirements they also have to whims and fancies of the various surgeons, okay. you have to take care of it. Okay. Uh, uh, as a nephrologist, we always try to see for uh, two things. One is, is there any rejection in the kidney? There can be acute rejection on the table or later. We try to monitor the kidney and see whether there is any rejection. If there is no rejection, we are very happy. We continue with the medicines. Commonly, we use uh, three types of medicines, tacrolimus, uh, mycophenolic, mofetil and uh, visalone as the three immunosuppressions. For people who are at high risk, who have uh, HLA mismatch, where we use uh, induction therapy, which could be ATG or baseliximab, which is necessary for that, we decide on the uh, patient's uh, HLA mismatch. So, after this, what is very important is we convey to the patient that they have to take this medicine lifelong. Without taking this medicine lifelong, the, they may lose kidney even after 10 years, 20 years. So, they have to take the medicine lifelong. So, what would be your costing? How do you cost them? The more complex the transplant, more the cost. More the cost. So, yeah. if you have a patient who is highly sensitized, which means he has been on dialysis and he has received multiple transfusion, such a patient is highly sensitized. So, such patients require more amount of immunosuppression. So, probably the amount of drugs dosage of drugs and the different types of drugs is so more that's, that's and a, he requires hmm. more constant monitoring. Okay. They have to come more frequently to the hospital. As compared to a patient, uh, uh, let us say you have a monozygotic twins, that wherein the constant. immunosuppression that is there the number of immunosuppressant drugs will be minimal and the acceptance of the kidney by the recipient is also excellent. That's in good. fact, the hmm. first transplant was done on a monozygotic Correct. way back in 1953. Correct. Absolutely. So, and, uh, and, and about I two years in, back… I in, think in India, we started first uh, transplant in Velour and then it started Correct. some simultaneously in Bombay. Bombay. And uh, the success rate rates were not so good initially, but now the success rates are so high that uh, transplants are uh, one of the… Uh, treatment for chronic kidney disease. Dialysis is to extend the life of the disease, but the transplant is the uh, one which will give you uh, a normal life. But mind you, transplant is very important for you. When we give transplant, when you do a transplant, you have to maintain the transplant kidney where you have to maintain with the 
immunosuppression. What is more important is when you do a transplant on an average, it will cost you around 20-25,000 rupees per month for the immunosuppression. So it might be for one or two years and later the cost of the transplant can come down. But it has to be 10 to 20,000 rupees which will be the cost of transplant post after the surgery. So you have to have this immunosuppression. The moment you stop the immunosuppression for the transplant, it goes into rejection. So this is very important for us to understand that you have to continue the medicine. How long do you put any stents in the kidney or, uh, or how do you approach the ureter? Because you put the, the ureter into the, the kidney. The ureter is joined to the bladder. The, so the donor kidney comes with the artery and the vein and the ureter. That ureter is joined to the patient's bladder. We join that. Normally, a stent is not required, but we put a stent in where in cadaveric transplants or in pediatric transplants, we put a stent and some cases where a time of surgery goes prolonged, then we put a stent. Stent is a temporary thing wherein it just helps the urine to drain faster, better. It's so that there is no tube, blockage. Uh, which is a tube which has multiple holes. It is a small S-shaped tube with multiple end holes plus side holes so that okay. the urine drains better and at the end of six weeks we remove the stent endoscopically. Uh, our success rate with pediatric is also excellent. We are also very happy with that. Uh, though not in this hospital I have done a transplant in those days of course. Maybe now there could be younger people also but we had done on a young child who was two years six months. Okay. Recently we had done a Donor which was two years, six months, if you remember. No, that's, uh, that's one of the unique cases. Can you share your uh, experience with that unique case? Because you are uh, fabergasted with that case at all. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> you have to tell that. Uh, it, this was a case, it's a unique experience because it's most of the times the donor is adult. Yeah, Very yeah. rare to get a pediatric donor. So this was a child who was affected with Japanese encephalitis. And unfortunately, the child was in a different hospital and... Because of the encephalitis, the child was brain dead. Now, the parents, uh, thankfully, uh, were very socially forward, so they agreed to donate the organs. But it, there was a little difficulty because virus infections, everybody is scared. And today, COVID era, everybody is scared of all viruses, not only this virus, but hmm. Japanese encephalitis. Now, as a urologist, I straight away said no. But then the, my friend Dr. Sanjeev Hiramath immediately said, no, Japanese encephalitis does not cross the blood-brain barrier, you could still consider. So then as a last resort, we just went through the literature quickly just to be 100% sure. And we realized that we can still take the kidneys, which is not possible with other viruses. If you have a rabies virus, no, no, it's an absolute no, no. But as far as a Japanese encephalitis virus, we could consider that for as a trans. So we harvested both the organs, two small organs, each in two years, three months, two years, six months old child, each slightly bigger than my thumb. And we did, decided that both the kidneys could be put in one adult recipient and we joined both the ureters, both the organs were joined and we removed the patient's aorta. It matched the patient's lower leg artery nicely and we could do the transplant, joined both the ureters and then joined it to the bladder. How much time did you take to do the transplant? Maybe This was hours. around four and a half hours. Four and a half. So it, it was a little bit more little than more. because of the small yes, kidneys yes. and the... But uh, what I would like to tell you is it was a miracle taking place in front of eyes. On table, the patients started passing urine in small drip, uh, small drops only, not much because it's a cadaveric transplant. Okay. But once by morning, the patient's output had dramatically increased. And it is shocking to know that the end of, we were monitoring this patient, not only clinically, uh, radiologically, but ultrasound wise. And at the end of one week, the kidneys had increased by 50%. Oh, Imagine the hmm. size doubling in size within a week's time. And the end of one month, I still have those pictures. At the end of one month, it was three-fourth the adult size. So it is a salute to nature that it can adapt so beautifully. And by the end of three months, both the kidneys had reached adult size. So okay. this is what I would like to emphasize. It is possible. So I, I would like to again emphasize on the fact, don't bury and burn kidneys. No, that's good uh, because uh, if you have a concept of cadaver donation, 
that can solve the whole problems out. If everyone donates who die, if they donate the kidney, I think there won't be any dialysis centers also because everyone will get transplant so faster. Then uh, regarding the uh, finances, finance aspect is very crucial in all of them. Do you have any social organizations who help us out and uh, do give the money for the patients who are in need? See, in a live related or a, a patient where it's a planned transplant, a lot of things can be done. The patient can arrange his finances, there are people to help out. But when it comes to a category, then suddenly the patient, you get a situation where they have to deposit a fair amount of money. As a hospital practice, if we are allotted the kidney, we make sure that the kidney doesn't go back. It is, we make sure some of the finances are arranged. We have various organizations, we work, start working up. We have the Prime Minister's Fund, the Chiefness to Resolute Fund, we start writing them. Money comes, it's not that the money doesn't come, it may be a government organization, but it does come, it may come a little late. But at least a commitment is there from the government side. Also there are Lions and Rotarians and all who come out. And nowadays one great thing is crowdfunding. I have realized that put on social media and crowdfunding comes up very well. So we have had situations where with crowdfunded almost we got a little more than what the actual transplant okay. was which we returned that to the... No, no, I, I, at this level I want to tell you that in uh, Sagar Hospital whenever there is a cadaver transplantation the management is very very clear. You do the transplant, don't worry about the money. So almost the money comes later. We never bothered about the money. The transplant is done first. And then we thought of that. So that's the yeah. good thing about the hospital management, which are very helpful for us to go ahead and do the transplant. That's how they motivate us to go ahead and do a transplant, which is very good for us. I think uh, Dr. Danpal, thank you. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And Thank uh, you, Dr. Sanjeev. And uh, nice to have an in, uh, interactive dialogue rather than just giving a, <laughs> a formal talk on that. A formal talk on sure. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.